We were in theory going to talk about uh, early pregnancy failure, which is a, a topic I personally think is very, very important in equine reproduction. Then I was going to do how we can effectively use the reproductive hormones, mainly ovulation, induction, and prostaglandin. Then we were going to do a little bit about problem mares. Then a little bit about a, a condition called endometrosis, which has some exciting new treatments. A little bit on pregnancy diagnosis and twins. Uh, I was going to do fetal sexing, but I was talking to Mickey Goss at the uh, uh, SAEVA meeting, and, and it doesn't seem a big deal here, so we can either have fetal sexing or skip fetal sexing, whatever you want. And then somebody did ask me ahead of time for a placentitis, so I put something in on placentitis. And then if we get a chance, we can look at some cases, which are always quite good fun. I'll show you some mares that haven't gone in foal or stallions that have had problems. Uh, but if somebody wants something else that isn't on that list, uh, let me know. I, in the practice, I mainly did the thoroughbred work, but as a practice, we did a lot of AI and embryo transfer and even a little bit of uh, oocyte retrieval. So, but I, I, I guessed this was mainly thoroughbred, so I haven't done much on, on, on semen analysis or anything. So if, if you want something about that, we can do that. Uh, I'm gonna come to those clickers in a minute, which some of the veterinarians had trouble with those. Uh, there'll be a, a wide range in a course. You can call a course an advanced course, a basic course, whatever. Uh, I, it never seems to uh, work that you get anything but a wide range of people, from people new to the business through to experienced vets. And, and I've always felt you can do presentation which gives something for everybody. So uh, I hope it'll work. I don't actually alter uh, many presentations from, from a, a veterinary group to a breeder's group. Uh, so if something isn't clear, then, then just ask about it. But I think I put a slide in about that. But I'm inherently lazy, so it seemed to me easier just to use the same presentations for breeder's talks as I do for vet's talks. I, I, I believe a well-educated, the clients that drove me mad were the clients who knew nothing. Uh, there's one or two familiar places, faces here, and, and I enjoyed it when I worked out here. I was very, very impressed. I wouldn't say surprisingly impressed by it, because I obviously expected a high standard. But as a veterinarian, I've never understood why uh, you wouldn't want to have a well-educated client, uh, because sometimes we all have to look at the mare and make a decision, and okay, I can tell you what's going on and the options, but you're the owner of the mare or the manager of the stud, and I think you must input into it as well, and, and therefore to be able to do that, you have to have a good understanding of things. So uh, I know one or two vets, and there was little bits of, of mumbling at the Congress that I was going to come down and teach you all to be veterinarians, but it, it doesn't work that way. It's, it's a nonsense, is that idea. I've never, I've never bought into it. The only clients that drove me mad were clients who didn't know anything, uh, which is why I'm, I didn't really do them. Uh, I, I'm hoping, I've called it correct, it's the Cape Breeders Club, I hope that's right. Uh, uh, it's very cold in England, it isn't quite as cold as that photograph, that was just a month ago, just before Christmas. I love mountain climbing and that was climbing with my son there uh, and, and, and one of our best friend guides. Uh, so I want to thank everybody who got me over here. S Susan Roy uh, has kindly, certainly done a lot of the coordinating and helped with the tickets and everything. Uh, I, I'm sure there are other people done a lot behind the scenes and, and of course you guys for coming so without you being here it doesn't doesn't amount to very much so there's my little thank you dance which is it's actually every dance I do thank you or otherwise so uh, as as uh, Helen said there I've been lucky to be uh, I'd spoken already at the SAEVA or EPG as it were equine practitioners group as it was and uh, about 15 years ago, and, and they had their 50th anniversary, so they invited about, I think, nearly a dozen uh, vets who had previously speaking, uh, spoken to come and present again. So uh, it went very well, I hope. Uh, there's quite a link. You might know that there is, and I just want to spend a little bit of time explaining to you. There's quite a link between the South African equine vets and the British Equine Veterinary Association. Uh, and long may that continue. We did have a wonderful time in Kruger Park. Uh, I really enjoyed it, but I, I was uh, 
kind of ready to leave. I, 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 I like exercising, and, and you're stuck in those. I wanted to bring my bicycle, but they wouldn't let me. But I said I was very fast, but they said I wasn't as fast as the wildlife. So I wasn't sure, but they never let me have the chance. So uh, I, I managed to get a wonderful ride in yesterday. I went up to Chapman's uh, Peak, is it, and uh, the Twelve Apostles, and did about 80, 90 kilometers. So I've, I've got my exercise back again. Uh, uh, yeah, please supplement a poor vet's income and buy some of these wonderful textbooks if you want. Uh, they're all available on the internet. My children always love finding them being offered at a discounted price. So there's nothing like children to bring you down in, uh, in size. If ever you feel you're important, they'll, they'll soon make it out. So heaps of them. Look at all those you can, you can go and buy. Helen touched on the credentials. I've worked in very high quality stud farms for many, many years. Uh, this was, I used to go backwards and forwards to Australia for about, I, I, well, quite a lot of seasons. Then I stopped doing that. Uh, and I did do a season in Zimbabwe, and then, I, then if, the last time I shuttled was, was to South Africa about 15 years ago now, maybe longer. It's worrying. Uh, and, but we always get Australian vets to come over to work for us in the breeding season, and, and they used to whinge that I gave them too much work and not the best stud farm. So, a, a friend of mine, two or three years ago, needed some help urgently, and I went out to Australia just to help him for four, four weeks or so. And as you can see, he put me in charge of the, the top stud farms there. I actually enjoy the, the different experience that I've had, and, and it's helped me in, in speaking to colleagues, because if all you do is very expensive stallions, you generally get a different population of mares. If you want to scan a mare with endometrial cysts and extra time, nobody minds. Uh, and that can be different if you're working at something with a much reduced stud fee. And if you've done all one or all the other, I don't think it gives you uh, as big an insight. So I've always been grateful that I've, I've worked with uh, very expensive stallions and, and, and some uh, much less expensive stallions. I think it gives you a good, uh, a good approach to things. Uh, I've sort of swapped my or hung up my rectal glove just about. I worked out... I thought I'd done a million ultrasound exams, but you always get a PhD, sort of some smart aleck, looked at that and figured I'd have had to have examined about 200 mares every day in my life. So we've actually downsized it to a quarter of a million, but I think it was enough. So I more or less hung up my rectal glove a couple of years ago and swapped it for a, a city suit. And what I do now is all the mistakes or potential mistakes veterinarians get accused of in, in the UK and Ireland we look at them and handle them. The reproductive will be missed twins, I guess, is the biggest uh, claim we have. So we can maybe touch a little bit on that uh, later. I asked what happened when twins were missed over here, and it seems you're a more forgiving bunch. You seem to take it on the chin, but uh, which is much better, really. These things will, will happen. What I'm not, although I, I, I get told I'm not to be, I, I try and put some jokes in my, my slides. Michael McIntyre is a famous comedian in in England, and, and at last year's Beaver Congress in Birmingham, he was on in an evening, and the committee had worked out it was more money to hear me speak than it was to go and listen to Michael McIntyre. So I was told if they wanted a comedian, they'd have gone to listen to him. So that just made me tell more jokes. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll tell an odd joke or two. I'm never, never, never sure. And finally, before we get into something, it's a smallish group, or relatively small here. And it's much better if you uh, input into it. If, 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 if A, I, I, I'll die if I have to speak for six hours. So you must join in. Uh, I, 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 if something isn't clear, ask. Uh, I love climbing. And, and if I'm not sure that he's put that rope on correct, it's better I say something than just think, oh, it'll be OK. So don't, if we're talking about something, as I said, we are going to go into quite some detail about these subjects. So if something isn't clear, uh, really, if, you can always ask me later, but you're far better to ask it here. Because if it's not clear for you, it probably isn't clear for other people. All, all we have to do with the program we've got is, is, is keep to a reasonable time frame. So what you can't do is go off on too much of a tangent about a particular situation. If you've got an issue on your particular farm and you want to have a chat about it, then, then you can come find me. Or, or if you think it's going to be of interest for everybody, then bring it up. But do say something. Uh, or if you've seen it and you think, 
I'm quite, I'm quite used to being in a minority of one, and I'm also equally convinced I'm always right. So uh, if you disagree, that's fine, then tell me. Uh, you won't change my mind, but it'll be, it'll be a good discussion. Uh, so I, quite, maybe you think this is an unusual thing to start with, early pregnancy failure. Uh, but I think it's probably, that it's certainly in mere gynecology, it's the biggest problem we're facing, I think, in, in uh, or, or it would be the best thing if we could do something about it. I think it would be the biggest contribution, uh, certainly in the thoroughbred world, to increasing our success on a stud farm. In equine reproduction generally, probably the most research and the most advanced that's getting done at the moment is actually not really appropriate to thoroughbred breeding because it's handling semen and different extenders. By doing that, these guys are finding they can make sperm longevity much, much longer than it used to be. Uh, within the field of, of mare gynecology, there's not really an awful lot changing. We, we've got some little tips when we talk about fluid in mares and we've got some uh, things on, on hemorrhagic follicles that don't ovulate properly. Uh, but there's not an awful lot happening in, in uh, mare gynecology research. And it's a shame because this area still is an area that needs some work doing on it. And I want to try and uh, get that through to you by spending a little bit of time on this slide, which a, a good colleague and friend of mine made up for a meeting some time ago, and I should really plot it on. But we've gone through uh, the 2016 data from Weatherbiz isn't quite here yet, but certainly the 2015 data shows that that red line or red diamond and the yellow uh, rectangle carry on at exactly the same since, uh, you know, for the, for the next eight years that aren't on that slide. And I'm sure most of you will know that, that the Weatherby's return to where every single thoroughbred breeding gets, uh, or 99%, get accounted for. So it's something like 17 or 18,000 mares on an annual basis. So it's a serious little bit of data, really. And I want you to try and work out what, what's happening with this graph. Now, the red diamond, uh, we sort of, it, it's a little bit out of focus there, but it says percentage conception, which... I, I, far be it from me, it would be certainly churlish to criticise Sydney's slide. I think it would be better called a 15-day pregnancy rate because, of course, it isn't the conception rate. We don't know what the conception rate is because we can't tell whether a mare is pregnant at that early stage. So it's actually the 15-day pregnancy rate. So the red diamond is, is the percentage of mares uh, uh, that we can get in foal at 15 days. And the, the, the yellow square or rectangle uh, is, is what actually turns up a live foal, okay? So can you see what, what I wanted to have a think about what's happened with that. Uh, what's happened in the, in, from, say from the late 70s through to when it began to uh, plateau a little bit in 2004, what happened to the pregnancy rate, the 15-day pregnancy rate in mares? Well, how's it done? Now, we've got to get used to this game. If you open your mouths and push air through, sound will come out, okay? It's got worse. No, what rate is it going? It's going up, isn't it? Have a little look. So, so say here, when we first started with this data, we were on, on, on a 78% of mares we could get in foal at 15 days. And by the time we got to it plateauing, 2005, we were up to in excess of 90%. So that tells us that we can do, uh, we've improved our ability, from, probably from a combination of things. If I had to say, I think the most important thing would probably be the introduction of ultrasound, although that came a little bit after uh, 77. It probably came in 82, 83. Uh, but we've increased that pregnancy rate. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I was hoping. Yeah. yeah. No, we never found out what that was. And, and equally, we never found out, goodness knows what happened in 1997, when for some reason there was quite a significant change. And we didn't really know. I, I, my feeling would have been it would have carried on just that slow increase up to about there. 
Uh, I don't know why it jumped so quick. I don't think anything dramatic happened from 2003 to 2005. It's a bit of an anomaly, and, and more observant people bring that up at the time. So I've had opportunity to think of a good answer and asked a few people, and there truthfully isn't one, but well done for, for observing that. Uh, and look what's happened with the live fall rate. Clearly, that has gone up as well. But what is represented by the difference between those two? What, what's that percentage? Why, why isn't the yellow line the same as the red line? Well, it's because a mare in foal at 15 days doesn't turn up a live foal. We all know that. We'll talk about the figures that, that lose it, and it's, it's mare dependent, all sorts of things dependent. But for the purposes of, of, of getting the, the, the fact from this slide, I just want you to... Uh, to think about what's happening. It's clearly going up, and it's sort of paralleling the red line. But the key thing to look at is, is uh, what the difference between those two is and how you think that's altering. So what I've brought out, which, which I like for, for talks because they give a little bit of variation, uh, is you've got these little voting systems. And they're not difficult, but I, I had three of the senior veterinarians in the front row at the Congress, who I think failed to grasp the concept of them throughout the whole meeting. But it really is very simple. If we put that on, look, uh, you can see that there's going to be uh, some choices there. You've got three choices, haven't you? And I've, I've done a little summary of that graph for you again. So you've got to ask yourself, which statement is, is false? Which one of these is not true? Have early pregnancy rates increased in the last 20 years, yes or no? Do less mares lose the early pregnancy now compared to 20 years ago? Or do the same number of mares? Now on your little white thing, you'll find one, two, and three. So you've got to press that. Now at the moment, nobody's pressed it. Now one person's got it. And there's no lurking in the room. I know there's 30... I wrote down how many of these. We should get to 33. Some people may be without one, so you'll have to... I didn't think it would... On a sunny day, I would... Yeah? Sorry, you're studying in, in 2007. Does that continue? Yeah, it carries on exactly the same. I've looked at it up to 2015. We haven't got the 2016 data yet. But it carries on. It hasn't altered at all. And that's a very important point. Uh, it hasn't got any better, no. The, the two of the, yeah, plateaued, sorry, yeah. Both, both columns have plateaued exactly the same. Exactly the same. Well, we'll, we'll give you that, that question as a little opener, so otherwise time drags on. So we'll, we'll put a little bit of a count if there's any. That's only about half of you have come up with it, so maybe you'll get more of a hang of it for the next, uh, the next few. <coughs> the, uh, well... You've got to see. What do you think the answer might be? Two. Yeah, okay. We've got, a, we've got half of you have got it. Half of you are outlying. The gap between those two has stayed exactly the same. So that tells us no matter how fancy we're getting about increasing pregnancy rates has now plateaued, all the research that's got done in the last 40 years has done absolutely nothing about reducing the pregnancy loss rate. And whether you're a veterinarian or, or a breeder, I'd have thought that must be frustrating for you. I know it, it always was for me when you have a mare in foal at 15 days and then she doesn't carry that through to term. And we're not really, the research isn't doing much about that. I figured as a practice we'd have to try and do something about that. So what I'll talk to you is, is, is what we do in our practice. And we, we're pretty, well, we know we have a much lower, or, well, I don't know whether much would be fair, but we certainly have a, a, a lower pregnancy failure rate than would be expected from the population of mares we deal with. Uh, So we're all okay with that. We, we, you've got that, that there, that we're not helping. The same number of mares are losing the pregnancy as, as always have.
So I think that, that certainly allows us to make that first point with accuracy. It, it has to be a major source of economic loss. We know from, from studies, as far as we can tell, that in most cases, much more than 90% of mares are going to go in foal uh, when, when you cover them with a stallion. And uh, we're actually losing even more pregnancies before we can detect them. We can first detect pregnancy if we wanted to at day 11, 12. Well, you could argue and occasionally we use this in a problem mare, even if it's a problem thoroughbred mare, and we just cannot get this mare uh, to pregnant at 15 days. We will do an embryo flush in that mare at day seven to see if we can actually recover a day seven embryo. And that will let us know at least she can fertilize and, and, and it tells us the uterine environment must be the problem for that mare. Uh, so it's, it's, it's relatively straightforward and it's a tool we almost use in a subfertile mare as a diagnostic tool. We will, if you've got a good mare that's just failing to conceive, it is worth thinking about doing a, a seven day flush just to see if you can get the embryo. Of course, it's nicer in sports horse mares because you don't have to waste the embryo. Uh, but it, it is, it, we, we, we have done it in, in certainly fairly valuable thoroughbred mares that we cannot find any reason why they're not conceiving. Uh, because we know that, that, the, that most of the loss probably occurs before day 14, before we're detecting it with ultrasound. Nonetheless, the figures we've got between day 14 and 40 are pretty significant. If you could do something about that, I think you'd be uh, uh, onto a serious benefit in your stud farm. I mean, if the rate's 10 through 17%, I mean, say you have 100 mares on your place uh, and you could halve that uh, loss rate. So say you were, you were in the middle there, say you were at 15% and you managed to, to halve that, uh, you could be talking about eight extra foals per every hundred uh, born. And, I, I, you know, that's quite a significant and financial benefit to a place. So that's why really as a practice, we weren't getting much help from research work, uh, but we felt we'd try some things because that's what we have to do. So I'll, I'll tell you the, the techniques we use. The difficulty we've got is that it's a multifactorial. Many, many things we think are involved in pregnancy failure and we haven't pinned down the exact one that it is. Just for a definition, we, we aren't talking about mid to late term abortion here. We're talking about early pregnancy failure, which is really somewhat artificial, but we pick the difference as day 40. So it's from when we first scan the mare to day 40. That's the percentage figure we're talking about here. And we can detect early pregnancy failure with ultrasound. So we've certainly increased uh, our ability uh, to know when something is happening with uh, 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 ultrasound in terms of pregnancy loss. And I think uh, in, in the long lecture we did up to the, uh, uh, at the, ESA, the, the, the meeting up in Kruger, I talked about what the future might hold for reproductive ultrasound. And we, we've begun using in the last three or four years uh, Doppler ultrasound in our practice. Uh, and this is, a, this is an image of a normal mare with twins, because it's nice to show you. Uh, I, would, I, I don't know for sure, I'd say she's round about uh, 30 days there. And did you notice, I'll go back to it if you want there. Uh, both of those, they, they, do you see the two, you're all happy, that's one, preg, one embryo there, that's a second embryo. The blood flow looks exactly the same to those two uh, embryos. Now, now, have a look at this slide, which is a mare that came in for twin punch, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about twin management. What do you think about those two? So that's one, uh, this, this is much further on, probably about 38, 40 days. So that's one embryo down there. I'll go back again. The bit in the middle was all uh, just umbilical cord. Uh, so, so ignore all that, that's just part of the, this is a division between the two embryos. Look at that top embryo. What do you think? Do you think it's getting less blood supply? Yeah, we, we, we didn't puncture that when it came in because the puncture, I'll talk to you about a puncture of, uh, of mares uh, t for, for, for late twins. We know we deal with twins at 15 days, but we also know that for, for a, a host of reasons we can, we'll talk about then, they slip through the net. Uh, so we face, we're trying to do something about them at, at those advanced stages and twin punch is something we can do. But it is quite invasive and, and it carries a small uh, risk of a complication and it carries a bigger risk of damaging the other pregnancy as well. 
So once we began using Doppler for these twins, if we saw that uh, variation in blood flow, uh, we, would, we would leave that mare. We wouldn't do a twin punch, and we would check her a week later. And, and in all situations like that, the second pregnancy would go on to fail. So it saved us having to do the twin puncher and risk damaging the other pregnancy. And even on the, we use very high quality, dig, as I'm sure most of you do, digital crisp ultrasound images. And, and we're obviously experienced in our practice at looking at those pregnancies. That they looked just, uh, there was a very obvious heartbeat in both of those pregnancies. We saw no difference on them until we put that Doppler ultrasound in. So, uh, that might be something for the future. We might get even better. That's what we're hoping. We're looking at that actively in the practice now, seeing if we can pick up uh, uh, poor blood supply to, 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 to embryos, and that's helping us predict pregnancy failure. And Doppler ultrasounds, uh, I don't think it's, we asked, I don't, I don't think it's not used much over here, is it? I don't think. But it, we started in the last two or three years in the UK, so I'm sure it's something that'll, uh, most of the ordinary uh, digital ultrasounds will, will, will let you have a Doppler facility on them. It costs a bit extra, but uh, it's good. But even without that, we can pick up pregnancies that are potentially going to have problems. So what have we got, what have we got here? This mare was covered 16 days ago. Yeah, the inference is she's going to be a 14, 15 days from ovulation. What can you see there? We can see a 15-day conceptus. It looks like something's going wrong on the lid. Yeah, well, the whole thing looked, Paul. What, what's it surrounded by? Fluid. Yeah, and what kind of fluid do you think? Well, that would be in there. I mean, I think what's come actually around it. Do you, do, you, do you guys differentiate? You know, what do you think of black? Do you think if you see fluid after breeding... Do you think it's more serious if it's that white echogenic color? Rather than black. I mean, yeah, I'd sooner see no fluid, but I think if you see that, it's a much more particulate, pussy type of thing. So essentially, that, that mare, I mean, it's fascinating that that mare has grown. We scanned her at, 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 at 14, 15 days from ovulation. She was a very well bred young maiden mare, actually. And, we get bitched at for putting too much antibiotics in there, so I thought, well, back, I won't, won't put antibiotics in her, and we had everybody around when we scanned her, and uh, that was the thing we saw, and I, I wish to God I'd infused antibiotics into that mare. Uh, essentially, that's surrounded by a sea of pus. What, what do you think if you... Uh, what would you do with that mare? Yeah. Why would... No, sorry, I meant the... I wish I'd put antibiotics in at breeding. No, I wish I'd put antibiotics in at breeding the mare, which I, I do routinely. I know it's not popular these days. I'm sure if I was a younger veterinarian, I'd look to just lavaging or something. But I might as well be honest. Every single mare in our practice got a post-breeding antibiotic infusion. Yeah, possibly. I mean, possibly not. But of course, it, it's, yeah, I've blown this image up and la di da it Actually, I was surprised at how well it had grown. Uh, I would have thought it would have been adversely affected by that environment. I actually found that quite interesting, how, how it had, 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 to all intents and purposes, looked very similar to a, to a normal 15-day pregnancy. So that mare, it, with that amount of fluid around it, if you, you know, if you scanned it on your stud farm, if you're the vet, or if you uh, were the breeder, what would you expect to get done with that mare? What would you do? Would you just, that's it? Would you try and treat it? Would you give a prostaglandin? Would you do nothing? Yeah, that's always quite relevant, yeah. This was very early. There isn't really a right or wrong here, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's also a little bit of a PR in these things. For some reason, uh, well, because it, it, it was a very well-bred mare, we had, uh, we had a lot of the, uh, the people had come around to see it scanned, and, and I didn't want to let them down. I knew that that, that pregnancy is going to fail. There's too much fluid around that concept. It's over for that pregnancy. There's no prospect of saving that. But it's then a little bit confusing because I did actually try and treat that mare. 
just to sow the seed that in four days' time I could break it to them a little bit easier that the, that the pregnancy had gone. So that's a little bit of the art of, of but I, I'm, I'm sure, I probably even bottled out and I made the stud manager explain it, that unfortunately it had gone. I mean, he would know, we, we both knew the thing was, was going, but everybody was, oh, I said, ooh, she's in foal, but it doesn't look quite, quite right. I mean, which was an understatement, really. Uh, so, yeah, I'm pleased to see we've got a lot of treaters. I mean, I would have, I did treat that mare, but, but if, if, if we had had the owner around, I'd probably have, 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 have prostaglandin it and flushed it through because I think we were probably fundamentally flawed. So here's a nice, I, all, all the ultrasound clips, uh, which I'll show you, I never edit them, so my routine is always do the left ovary first. Yeah, we can fire away while this is on. Sorry, Doug, you just no, it's okay. Yeah. Do you find any resistance for that? No, no, no. Because it's depicillin, which isn't used anyway, uh, and framomycin or gentamicin. And it's only a six and six infusion. When, and, when do you do that? Well, we'll do the problem mare, so that's a nice thing. We can probably deal with it then. Uh, I'm going to talk about fluidy mares. We do it the first day. We, we stop, we don't treat in relation to breeding, we, uh, in relation to ovulation. We'll, tr we'll see a mare, we always see every mare the day after covering. And that isn't really to see whether they're ovulated. With natural covering, I don't care whether she's ovulated or not. Uh, it's to put antibiotics into the uterus. Or if it's less than two centimeters of fluid, more than two centimeters, you'll get antibiotic and lavage. And between uh, zero and two centimeters of fluid, she'll probably just get oxytocin and antibiotics. Yeah. Six and six, six, six and six, which so always get written up, but six mils of depicillin and six mils of framomycin or gentamicin. So did you, did you see that pregnancy there while we're talking that through? I mean, it's really floating around in a great big bag of pus. I mean, I, I find it incredible that it had sort of grown in, in that. Re I'd have thought that environment would have killed that early pregnancy. It, it's actually why... Uh, if we do an embryo flush and it's a very dirty looking, if we get sort of pus out with the embryo, if we wash that embryo and transfer it, we get very good rates. So I, th I think the embryo is able to withstand quite a lot of uh, uh, abnormal uterine environment until about day 15, 16. Then I think, you know, we see it because if we transfer late embryos, they're much easier to damage. So I think if we haven't sorted that uterus out, uh, early on, then, then I think the pregnancy will, will fail from probably 15, 16 days onward. But that's something where I've always felt happy with my approach of being quite aggressive with mares. I'll, I'll take a chance on a mare of, of having a bit of fluid or a bit of uh, infection, as long as it's not going to pass it on at covering, because I'll work on that mare afterwards. And that's always the approach I've done. And some people will contrast that. If you pick areas, you know, it isn't that some of my colleagues in Newmarket have a different idea from them. They, they have a, a, a much, probably a healthier population of mares. I mean, when both of us teach on an ultrasound course, I see a mare with a couple of centimeters of fluid and yeah, we'll give her a bit of oxytocin and antibiotics and she'll be all right. If the Newmarket boys scan her, they're jumping up and down with two centimeters of fluid as if, oh my God, this mare has got pyometra in here. It's, it's horrendous, you know, because they don't see those sort of old fluidy, that's an exaggeration, uh, but you know what I mean. And, and, and I, I say it if they're here as well, it's to draw the contrast between the, the populations of mares. And, you know, a lot of the stud farms where stallions aren't standing a lot of money, if you start trying to tell the breeder who's brought the mare to you, well, she isn't quite right at this cycle, we're gonna treat her and use the next cycle, you won't get a chance because they'll have taken that, the stallion down the road who won't faff around with it and will cover it. We never had a lot of option to line mares up nicely ahead of time. If a mare came and was ready to be covered, we had to cover and take our chance afterwards. There are exceptions, but we'll talk about that uh, in due course. So just, I don't want to burden ourselves down with hormone stuff, because it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a little bit uh, tiresome, but, but I want to just keep you uh, abreast of sort of clinically what we're doing in terms of drugs. And the hormone really we need to know about is progesterone because that is obviously the hormone of pregnancy. 
that the estrogen comes from the follicle, ovulation, progesterone happens. So if mares are losing the pregnancy, the inference could be there's some defect in, in her ability to produce progesterone. Now, uh, the interesting thing in the mare is, is that in actual fact it begins to happen before ovulation. There's a degree of, of, of luteinization of a follicle, a quite normal follicle, even before th that follicle ovulates. So the point is progesterone goes up very, very quickly in the mare after ovulation. And the important thing that means in terms of, which is one of the reasons uh, the last few years, as we've taken on board that stallion semen lives longer than we thought it did, we've kind of moved to covering breeding, certainly potentially problem mares, mid-teens, known fluid producers. We'll quite deliberately cover those 48 hours, maybe even 72 hours ahead of them ovulating, because that gives us more time to deal with that uterus before the progesterone goes up. And there's a big variation in the resistance of the tract. You know, that's a fine that the first phone to go off is okay, the second phone, and it's a great place for having a conference in a wine or whatever it is, the second phone that goes, let's have to buy the, uh, the audience a round of drinks, so. Uh, progesterone goes up very, very quickly in the mare. And, and you may think, well, is that important to me as, as, as in, in, in getting mares in foal? Well, it is, because it's one of the reasons that once the mare is ovulated, I don't think you can put much, uh, I don't like going into the uterus of a mare after ovulation. So it's why we'll generally breed our mares a day or two ahead of anticipated ovulation days, if we're using natural covering. And then, of course, we know in the non-pregnant mare, around 14, 15 days, prostaglandins released from the uterus, uh, travels to the ovary and gets rid of the corpus luteum. And we've got an artificial prostaglandin, and we'll talk about that next when we talk about hormones. But in, 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 in the natural situation, that's what happens in a non-pregnant mare. In the pregnant mare, that conceptus buzzes around the uterus for the first uh, 7 to 15 days when it's in there and blocking the mare's natural prostaglandin release. If it didn't do that, well, heck, the, the, the mare wouldn't, wouldn't go in foal. So progesterone is the, is the dominant hormone of pregnancy. So just to skip back to our, our, our mare, this has a much more subtle uh, appearance, doesn't it? But can you see that, that pregnancy there? And can you see what's around it? A little bit of fluid around it, but what do you think of that volume? You'll certainly save those pregnancies if you're aggressive with them when you spot them. If you, if, if you faff around and leave those two or three days, those pregnancies will fail. But if you're aggressive with those pregnancies with that amount of fluid, uh, so we can put this straight on, so we probably don't need the answers. But what I would be looking for you to say here was, was I would treat that mare. I treat it with systemic antibiotics because we can't use uh, we can't use uh, oral antibiotics. Uh, sorry, we can't use intrafusion because I think, as the question came down at the point, we're going to damage that pregnancy. I'm just checking you're listening now because I've well. If you guys do something different, these are quite helpful for me to build up an idea of what you do. I'm not convinced you've grasped the voting thing yet, but, but I'll, keep, I'll keep working at it. I'm nothing if not persistent. By the end of the, the day, there will be, that number will say 33. I, I, we, we would very heavily treat that mare with systemic antibiotics. The, the antibiotics we pick are trimethoprim sulfur because they're oral and they penetrate quite well into the uterus. Uh, interestingly, there was a, 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 a guy, I don't know him, is, who was a, the compounder there, who was talking about doxycycline, which I think was quite an interesting point. We, we haven't got a proper oral doxycycline uh, in the UK, certainly, and my understanding is not in South Africa. We have to mess around with the, uh, the human dose or the human tablets, and even for treating a foal, it, it's quite a lot you're grinding up and faffing about with. But a compounder will make up a, an adult version of doxycycline and it does penetrate quite well in the uterus so that might be something I'll look at now we've for the first time got a compounder in UK. 
Well, you can do. It's quite acidic. I mean, it'd be a heck of a volume. And Caradox, is, it, which is what we use in the UK, is very, very acidic. And they really, I don't know if you've used it in foals, but they really don't like it. You'll get, it, you'll get the first one down them, but you really struggle to get subsequent doses down. Yeah? What was the second Altronidase is progesterone. Regume. Sorry? Yeah, we would, I, would, I would in that mare because I'm, I'm worried that there's inflammation there, Pippa. So I'm worried that the corpus luteum is going to be, even if I can see it looking nice and pretty there on ultrasound at the scan and I just see that fluid, I have to have a suspicion that enough prostaglandin has already been released from this mare that she's going to undergo luteal regression. So rather than take the risk of that, I will put them on uh, Altranagest as well. Uh, and... and, and that, that's just the, uh, the system we do. I think you've got to... I, I'm concerned the corpus luteum will fail in those mares. Well, that's all... Uh, yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, once you've embarked on a, a mare with Regumate, well, I'll tell you, we do. Some people don't, and there's good evidence that you can. Right? Well... This was a, we, we have a system now, we, 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 we give out a sheet, which anyone who wants it, I can print out, we call it the sheet to go home with the, the breeder sheet. I gave a little bit of spiel about early pregnancy failure, and I said, we're going to have your mare on Altrenagest uh, once a day till day 80. And from day 80 to day 100, we begin to go every other day, day 100 to 120, uh, we go to twice a week. And... Within the practice, different veterinarians would say a slightly different thing. And I got so fed up of the breeders saying, well, well, hang on, Jimmy Crampton, he says we should do that. Now, it didn't make any difference, but, but we had a meeting in the practice, and I said, right, this is a system we're going to use for Regumate. Now, I don't know whether you have to do it. You probably don't. There's pretty good evidence from day 90, 100, you can take the ovaries of a mare out, and she'll stay pregnant. So it certainly can't be involving progesterone but if you have a good mare and you stop the progesterone at day 100 and it loses that pregnancy I get so fed up of the owner wittering in my ear about having taken her off that progesterone that I just keep them on it yeah good yes yeah, very good. I missed that out, and, and I think that's a very good point. The question is there is it's an inflammatory process going on. Uh, so would an anti-inflammatory be a good idea? And I, I think I just missed it off there because we'll often give those... Well, we will give... Some people will give those mares flunixin, we call it, finidine, as an anti-inflammatory. I guess uh, because I've put them on progesterone, I'm sort of protecting the them from the point of view of, of getting rid of the corpus luteum anyway. So I guess you could wonder, maybe you could avoid use, if you could settle the inflammation down, I, maybe you could just use the anti-inflammatory. So there's a lot of rationale to using it, and there was certainly nothing wrong with doing it. I tend to use, I tend to just as a policy say, right, we're putting this mare on, on, on artificial progesterone now. What I can't say for sure is that we need to do that. So I fully accept a criticism that we've put a mare on, on potentially quite an expensive treatment for quite a lot of time. And there's handling implications as well, which are a little bit of a pain. Because uh, you don't have injectable once a week Altrenagest here, do you? But why do the compounders could make that? Yeah. Oh, it's an injection. Yeah. And do you have to give that daily? Uh, depending on the situation. Yeah. I, I, yes, uh, I guess you... For, for instance, if we're crushing it to it, yeah. immediately progesterone yeah. and yeah. for two days. Yeah, yeah. We would put the mare on... We would put, I would give her a double dose of oral altranagest. There's, there's a... Australia would inject with progesterone. There's, I don't know if any of you have been or worked or from the UK... They have a different approach. If you told a mare owner or even, I mean, the stud managers will do it or manageresses or whatever, breeders wouldn't like their mares injected with things. We'd have, it's just as a, 
they don't like injecting their, the mares. It, it sounds a bit strange, but that's it. I, yeah, no, that's a little bit after my own heart, but... but <laughs> I don't feel the thing. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that would be the thing, yeah. No, I, I think there's an argument about whether or not... The question is, there, could we use Depo-Provera? The argument about whether or not progesterone supplementation is helpful or not will run and run, and we don't know. There is a lot of evidence to say that a, 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 a defective corpus luteum is not the reason these mares lose a pregnancy. I don't believe that, which is why we use a lot of Altrenagest. But, or, or injectable, we are going to use injectable now because it's become available in the UK from this breeding season and as a weekly injection with 3 mLs is much more attractive. Uh, but the other progested gens like Depo-Provera and there's others, the people who've studied them say they don't bind, they don't attach very well to, to the the, the, the progesterone receptor in the uterus cell, wherever it is. So I think you're introducing yet another complication if you use Depo-Provera, because I don't think it boosts progesterone levels. And in the stage of I think it's still the same. I think if you're going to give anything, I think you should give Altrenagest, that, or, 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 or the natural progesterone. I think one, one, one or the other. It, I think people have liked the idea of Depo-Provera because it, it, it's the injection and it's quite a, it's a well-tolerated injection. The progesterone in oil is quite thick and, and there's a potential for abscess formation and all sorts. So, okay, this is just, uh, I mean, this is maybe a little bit of a, 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 a detail for you here, but, but it's just something, uh, I'd be interested to know what you think. Uh, there's a lot about fake news these days, isn't there? But I've always thought that. I never believe something I read, really, in a book, necessarily. If you do a lot of something and you're seeing a difference to what is written, then maybe you can challenge that idea. Uh, and this is an example of a 22-day pregnancy. So can you see what I put the arrow on there? That's the embryo, isn't it? Day 22. That's when you first... We're all loose in our daily terminology. We, 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 when we scan a mare at 15 days, we say, oh, look, there's the embryo. Well, it isn't the embryo, if we're being correct. It's trophoblastic fluid, or, and in fact, it's the yolk sac. The embryo itself doesn't appear till day 21, maybe 22. It uses a two, three millimeter structure. And have a think, when you're scanning your mare at 22, 23 days, where does that embryo, if you imagine the embryo, or, or now I'm doing it, see, if you imagine the uh, yolk sac fluid is a clock face, where does that pregnancy, the embryo, generally develop? Yeah, if it was a clock face, it'd be somewhere from four, five, six, seven, eight o'clock, wouldn't it? Okay. Do you think, do you worry about uh, it if it doesn't appear in that four, five, six, seven o'clock position? I mean, a lot of books said you were to, uh, but I never bought into that. In fact, so we went back and did a piece of work, it must be nearly, nearly 12, 14 years ago now, and we looked at all the pregnancies where the embryos developed in a position outside the four to eight o'clock position, and bizarrely, none of those failed. So I really don't care if the pregnancy doesn't develop in that four, five, six, seven, eight o'clock position. Uh, I don't think it indicates that that pregnancy is going to fail. But I also think this slide shows you something else, which is, is particularly useful uh, to illustrate the fact that when we ultrasound a mare, we're taking a two-dimensional slice of a three-dimensional object. And if we don't remember that all the time, and, and, and we just think what we see on the screen is what is happening, I think that's where we're very prone to misinterpreting what we're looking at. And particularly if we do that at the 15-day pregnancy scan, I imagine that's where we're missing twins, as it were. So if you can, this is a bit of a... Uh, I've told you a little bit of these answers, but have a think about this. So the M, which of the following is, is a lie, is not true? So do you think that embryo is developing in the normal position? 
Do you think it's a normal size for 22 days? Do you think that pregnancy is high risk to fail? Or do you think the top of the uterus is marked by the arrow rather than how it looks on your screen? No, none of you did not. <laughs> well, that's a pretty poor turnout, did you? Did I? Did you press yours? You must have pressed yours. No, it must. No, it won't now. You must have missed it. it maybe didn't like your answers to that. I don't know. <laughs> oh, I oh, did. That. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Just didn't. Maybe the counter wasn't working there. Uh, Yeah, okay, well, for my money, what, what, what I was wanting to show with this slide is, is that, uh, right, so let's look at number one, the embryo is developing in the normal position. Now, we've just decided that we think the normal position is from four o'clock to eight o'clock, so why wouldn't you think uh, those 14%, those that, that we've, we've just decided, hadn't we, that that was a normal position? So do you think that embryo is, is developing uh, in, a, in a normal position? Yes. Do you think it's a normal size? Yes. So we all thought it was normal size for 22 days. The pregnancy is high risk to fail. No, I don't think that pregnancy is high risk to fail. What has happened in this mare is, for whatever reason, maybe she's got full guts or something, that uterus is twisted on itself. And, and that's the way it looks. You can't think you look at a nice ultrasound image and it's the right way. That mare's uterus is twisted for some reason. It's got bent down there. Now, that doesn't really matter for a one-off preg scan, but that's how you'll misinterpret when, you know, you, you'll miss twin pregnancies because you don't appreciate you're taking a little slice through that mare's uterus. So the, that, that, that uterus has got, uh, that's how it should be really. But we can't do anything about it. We can orientate it because you should know that at the first pregnant, at, 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 at 20 odd days, we can always orientate the uterus because the dorsal part of it is thicker, isn't it? These are the, you know, we can all scan mares at 15 days. We can all scan mares at 22, 23 days. It's not until you're going to start looking at these more subtle pieces of information, you're going to lift yourself from somebody doing an okay job to somebody doing a better job. And you can always recognize the dorsal part of the uterus because it's thickened. And it often will have a little degree of edema pattern. And we'll talk about that in, in a little bit, what we think of edema at a first pregnancy scan. But learn to orientate the uterus properly. There's nothing we can do about that. I don't know why she's got it twisted around, but she has. But if you fail to interpret that, I think you're at risk for a pregnancy uh, miss, which is an awful phrase. Okay, well, we've looked at fluid and we, we've accepted that's a bad thing. We don't like seeing free fluid in the uterus alongside a pregnancy. What do we think, and you, I cannot believe you haven't had this, so tell me, what do you what do? You do? What do you, when you scan a mare at 15 days and she has an edema pattern in that uterus, what do you think of that? Do you like seeing that? No, we don't like to see it. Is it normal? No, I don't think it's normal. Uh, I think if you get a little bit of edema around the early pregnancy, that's probably fair enough. Uh, most reproductive vets, certainly whenever I... I have I've my machine set at quite a high contrast. I just like looking at things quite black and white. So when, when I scan, perhaps compared to someone scanning tendons for uh, damage, I have the contrast set quite high. So it's, it's always quite a black and white image. So I can always make a case for a small degree of edema when I do a, a preg scan. And as long as it's just around that 15-day pregnancy, I'm not so worried. But if, I, if, if, if that mare was pregnant at the base of the right horn and I go up that mare's left horn or in the uterine body and there's that marked edema pattern, I don't like to see that. So we'll put that mare... Uh, 
we'll, we'll bang her straight away with a double dose of, 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 of Altrenagest, of progesterone, uh, Regumate. It would be, there is a theory there's inflammation there, but the difficulty if you just give her is the non-steroidal, uh, is that I think that 15 days is when you're really at risk for losing the pregnancy. I think you've got to get in there. By all means, give both, but I think the anti-inflammatory alone won't, uh, won't, won't damp down that, that, that inflammatory environment. So I think you're best uh, to do it. So I think if you've got widespread edema, the pregnancy will fail. It's nothing to do with the follicular development of the mare at that stage. It's my favorite thing when I have vet spending time with me or vet students with me is I love to scan a mare at 15 days, see a nice conceptus, uh, a nice 15 day, uh, 18 millimeter structure, go on to the left ovary say, there's a very obvious corpus luteum sitting there, very clear. Now I'll go on the right ovary, there'll be a 34 millimeter follicle and I'll say to the vet or vet student, Oh, God, this is a shit. Look, we've got this mare nicely in foal, but oh, there's a follicle coming up. She's coming back into season. Are we worried about it? And, and it's a little bit unfair because you're wording it such that you're trying to make out it is. What I want them to say is, no, John, rubbish. We're not bothered at all about a 35-day follicle, a 35-millimeter follicle at a preg scan. I couldn't give a, a hoot about that. What I'm bothered about is whether there's not a CL there because the corpus luteum is always dominant. I mean, we know, you know that because the biggest follicles a mare ever gets are when she's about 35 to 40 days in foal. So don't tell me it's a bad thing to have a follicle in a pregnant mare. It's a bad thing not to have a CL in a pregnant mare. Whether she has a follicle or not, I really couldn't care because if she hasn't got the CL, it doesn't matter whether she has a follicle or not. She's not gonna stay in foal. So, you know, it's the same reason as you can't be fooled into thinking just because our mare has a follicle that she's ready for covering. Whenever you examine a mare, and this is something that isn't sort of written in books, is a hard thing to get across to, uh, to vets when we do CPD, is, and, and when they ask me about problem mares, uh, or, or mares that they're, they're managing, you have to decide, every time that mare is in a crush, you have to decide it's steroid hormone balance. You have to decide whether that mare is under estrogen dominance or is under progesterone dominance. And if you ever examine a mare and you don't make that decision, well, I don't think you're doing a very good job because you've got to know that. And we use things like, yes, you may have teasing. I don't know, is teasing still getting done over here? Yeah. I guess it will because you, do you, do you want to go to a stud farm in the UK and tell them that they haven't got the labor that you have available? It was the best thing. Doesn't mean teasing isn't a good thing. That someone's getting misinterpreted. Oh, John, you don't like teasing mares. We do, but the biggest reason, early on, I picked up some, some stud farms in our area because I could tell them they could stop doing that. They don't have to tease us. I'll tease a mare for them because I'm making a decision about the steroid hormone balance. So I've got to use things like, is, the minute you see an edema pattern in the mare's uterus, we'll talk a little bit about edema, you're home and dry because she must be under estrogen dominant. So it must be a true follicle in, in a follicular phase. But other things are looking on the ovaries for corpora lutea. And doing a speculum exam, is that done much over here, checking the cervix? And do you do it with a speculum or do you do it manually? Do you feel the cervix or have a look? Yeah. Depends on, I mean, we have a system that at some time, well, usually when, early, when the mare presents to stud, we will always have done a digital vaginal exam of the cervix. Uh, thereafter, we generally use a speculum exam. The reason that we have as a practice policy, we must have made one thorough evaluation of that cervix. You always learn from your mistakes, and we had a very good mare came to us uh, with a foal at foot, and her cervix looked normal to me on speculum throughout while we were swabbing it, while we were covering it and so on. After three cycles, this thing was not in foal. So I thought, I'm going to have a feel of this mare's cervix. And there was a socking great chunk out of that mare's cervix. And that was why she was failing to conceive. And I could not see that on, on, on the, the a speculum. Whether if we'd have put in the great big spread speculums, we might have seen it. But on the routine, cardboardy, disposable things we use, 
that mesh cervix looked normal to me. So we then decided, right, at some point, so you might as well do it when the mare first presents, if she's, uh, as, you know, as long as she's not luteal, or pregnant, obviously. Uh, you would check the cervix, because the cervix getting damaged at foaling is, is, is a relatively common occurrence. Dystokia is a very interesting subject, and whenever I talk about it at a, at a meeting, I, I, I always ask people, what are the three considerations when you're dealing with a dystokia mare? And everybody gets, oh, we've, we've got to look, uh, uh, you know, we've got to try and keep the mare alive. And, oh, yeah, we've got to try and get a live foal out. They never get the third. You know what the third criteria is? Say you had a very well-bred uh, filly that had, had, had won for us would be the oaks. I think you call it the oaks as well. She goes to stud and she's foaling with her first foal. How pleased do you think the owners of that will be if you writhe and tear and struggle like hell to get that foal out, proudly tell them, oh yeah, well your foal's dead, but look, I've got it out of the mare for you, and you, you've ruined that mare's cervix. You aren't going to be very popular. So you've got to consider the mare's future breeding potential. So that was a little bit of an aside to a bit of a leap of faith. Right? We're not going to get beyond the first lecture, I don't think, but that was a leap to the cervix. So we can use a cervix evaluation, we can use looking for a CL. We could take a blood sample for progesterone, but I always, you know, I think the mayor's got an inbuilt progesterone assay called a cervix. So I, I, I never had to bother taking lab tests. I could always make a decision, but I always had to make a decision. So even when you're doing a preg check, uh, you know, I'm thinking, does this mayor, is, is she seeming to not have enough progesterone around? And then around about 15 years ago, so I don't know whether I was using it when I would probably, I think it was just after I got back from here. Uh, we were contacted, all drug companies change now. They're all getting, in the end, there's only going to be about three veterinary drug companies, I think. But back then there was a company called Intervet who used in the dairy industry, uh, and I think it's worldwide because some of the, uh, it's, it's used over here, I think, isn't it? Uh, they found that if they gave it around day 10 or 11 after ovulation in a cow that had been usually inseminated, uh, there was around about a 10% improvement in pregnancy rate. And the people don't know how that's working. It might be stopping the corpus luteum disappearing, or it might be boosting its function. So somehow helping that corpus luteum. So... They said, right, John, would you do a, would you do a study in mares for us? Uh, so we did. We took 578 mares, so a reasonable trial, and we just allocated the mares into pairs on a, on a round, you know, it was treated, not treated, just as they came through uh, 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 for breeding. And then we made a note, right, day 10 after ovulation, they were going to get an injection of uh, receptile, a whole vial, 10 ml. Now, you can't see that, but I think it's, it's either in the notes or whatever. Uh, you can see here, the blue is the treated group. So you can see the treated mares had a slightly increased pregnancy rate. But, but we, that wasn't significant. Any, when you publish veterinary research or clinical data, we have to obtain what they call a significance level of it. And we couldn't get that. It, it isn't a significant level of improvement uh, when we just did it across that uh, Range. So it improved the pregnancy rate, but we couldn't show it statistically. It also, but again, this was not a significant improvement. So it becomes very hard to publish that data because it doesn't matter for here, but, but the criteria for these journals is that you have to show a degree of significance. So it increases pregnancy rates between days 28 and 30. Now, if you can bear with me, this is the important message for you with this. The increase in pregnancy rates at the second and third cycles was great and was, was significantly greater in treated versus non-treated mares compared with the first cycle. Now, what does that mean? Well, I don't know what your, pers what, what your first covering pregnancy rate is, but, but I'm guessing it, it'll be something around about 65%. You would expect two out of three mares to go in foal first time. So that's quite a high percentage, isn't it? So if the mare doesn't go in foal, if she's in that third, we don't know what the problem is, 
But I think you would have to say that may have some sort of problem. Uh, so what that third point is saying is if you don't want to go at the expense and the time and trouble of treating routinely, because it's quite expensive is, is, is a vial of Receptal. Uh, if you want to see the best improvement, well, well, wait till second and third cycles. You've already got rid of two-thirds of mares. So you're drastically cutting down the number of mares you, you, you treat. And uh, that's how we use it in our practice. Any mare with a history of embryonic loss or a likely candidate for it, and all mares who are second cycle for us, bang, that's it. Well, and, you know, unless for some reason the owner said they didn't want to pay. I mean, we, we tend to, because we're so uh, enthused about it, and, and it's disappointing to me that the veterinary profession hasn't really taken this treatment up. Uh, I'd like people to have a look at it more and, and tell me if you're finding it doesn't have any effect, then I'll, uh, I might become less enthusiastic about it. Is this, you're getting blamed. He's, he's picking on you. Yeah, you've, you know, just... On the treatment they're on, on the second cycle, it's 10 days after... 10 days after ovulation. Uh, Guys, as, shot, as many shots? As uh, uh, well, some people have wondered if you can give half the vial, 5 ml, but, but, but we've, stuck with the, we, we've stuck with it, the one vial, given once, 10 days after ovulation. I think, you should, why not just pick... I mean, the difficulty is you, you, it's, you struggle to prove a significance and probably you'll say, right, we'll try that bloody thing once and if it works, you'll think, well, it's marvellous. If it doesn't, you'll think, what, what a bloody idiot. Like it's got no better. He's still talking rubbish. Uh, but I, I, I do wish more, more breeders would try it and stud managers and vets. Uh, just in case. I'm not saying it'll work every time, but it, it, it's, it's, it, we think it's a, along with our aggressive treatment of, of little bits of fluid, along with treating mares after breeding, and along with uh, progesterone supplementation, we think the bucerellin is a reason, the receptal, why we get less pregnancy failure. Now, some people will say, and it's quite a valid question, is, well, do you do both? Do you put them on regimated a first preg scan and uh, give them a, a GnRH injection as well? Uh, I think the advantage of the GnRH injection is that you're doing it uh, ahead of the, the potential problem. It's all well and good at 15-day scan to say, oh, I think there's quite a lot of edema here. Uh, let's get the mare on progesterone. But you may be too late. If we're going to use progesterone uh, when we really think we've got a problem, a potential problem, we'll begin it day five after ovulation. We won't begin it... Uh, some, some, some colleagues talk about using it at the time of ovulation. I don't, and you could, if, you, if you remember what I said before, you, would, you, you can probably guess why. I think you'll push the progesterone up too quickly, and if you've got any bacteria hang, or inflammation hanging around, and you go shooting the progesterone up on day 0-1 or 2, I think you're, you're going to be at big risk for causing uh, a, po a persistent post-breeding endometritis fluid accumulation in those mares. So mares which we think uh, are at high risk for pregnancy failure, and we may be going to supplement with Altranagest. Uh, we put them on uh, from day five onwards. But, you know, the jury, and, and it's why it's important at a preg scan to look for the corpus luteum. I always ultrasound for the C, and I like to see a good, obvious corpus luteum. Clearly, it's important to get used to looking at the ultrasound for another reason. Why else at a first preg scan should you check both ovaries for CLs? You shouldn't be scanning mares at 15 days and not noting the, the, the location and what else, a number. CLs. What percentage of mares have a multiple ovulation, i.e. a double ovulation? Yeah, the books will tell you it might be up to 20, 25% for the thoroughbred. We've got some data coming out next year showing it's approaching 40%. That's huge. So if you're not dealing with twins very, you know, twin crushes are routine. I mean, one in, one in three first preg scans are going to be a twin crush for us with the thoroughbred. But you might be squashing the champion. 
Yeah, I've, I've had to crush a frank or two in there, yeah, 150 yeah, million rand, you know. Yeah, you've got to pick, I've got to pick, I pick the best runner. That's, that's, I, I've got a special machine. <laughs> Let me tell you the best one, hey. And, you know, you'll know, if you have other veterinarians, they're nodders, they'll, they'll point you to research which says, oh, evidence that that supplement with progesterone doesn't help. And there isn't very much evidence, but I've waited for the research people to give me evidence and I haven't done it. And, and the bottom line is that, you know, my job is about getting maximum preg rates on a farm. Now, you may decide you can't do it on uh, an economic ground or you don't want to bother, that's fine. That, that's part of why I was talking about having a well-educated breeder. I, like we, I say, right, we could put this man on progesterone if you think that the cost is justified and so on and so forth. If you say to me, well, do we definitely need to do it? You know, I can't answer, McKinney, you can't. No one in this room, that's an unanswerable question. You, 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 you stop at day 80. Yeah, I, I, I'm not... I, I, I have a very expensive lifestyle, Pippa, I guess. <laughs> no, I mean, it's a good discussion debate. We don't know. Well, this is what used to happen with us, and, and it got confusing for Mera because they would say, well, I go to that bloke's stud farm, he says this. You say that. The truth is we don't know, really. And we never will know that for sure. I just felt, you know, either you as a stud farm or, 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 or as a veterinarian, I have to give a consistent message. Breeders don't like an inconsistent message. So if within the same practice... We went to day 80 and then began to taper. But there is an argument you can just stop at day 80. I, I, I think I'd be slight... I think I would go to day 80. I just think... But then again, other people say they'll wait to see if they get a bunch of accessory CLs at 40 days. So if you scan at your third preg scan at 35, 38, whatever, roundabout then, and you go onto the ovaries and there's plenty of, of you know, there might, may, by then maybe two or three obvious corpora lutea, your cervix is nice and closed, there's no edema pattern in the uterus, there's a very good argument that you can say, well, well, hang on, I'll stop it now. Now, if you want to take that, it's artificial that I do it. I do it, and yes, it sounds a little bit funny, it sounds a bit weak, but I generally do it because that's what I've had said to me. When I've taken these mares off, I can tell the owner all the theory of the like, but if they're going to turn around and say, I told you you should have kept that mare on Altranagest, the argument that, well, hey, it wouldn't have made any difference, they ain't going to believe that. They're convinced their mayor lost that pregnancy because you, that we meet, took that off. So if I'm at a place like yours where you can have the, it comes back to the recurring theme of if you can have an intelligent conversation with the person in charge, you can make the call. And I'll say to you, well, you know, I think that this mayor's looking like there's plenty of progesterone around. So, hey, why don't we, why don't we take it down? But then we've been both involved in that decision. So you can't turn around to me in three weeks and say, I told you it was a mistake to do that. So it's a little bit of a, the point is, I'm sure we have them on it too long, and I'm just trying to explain why, why I feel we have to do it. So it isn't disagreeing, it's trying to explain why this difference exists. And, you know, I don't know, you, you were there having them on a little bit longer. It might be because you've had, a, you know, the breed will talk to their friend somewhere, who, t who they, she'll say to them, oh, you, 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 sh you should have kept it on it longer. And, and then they're, they're, they're that in your ear, aren't they, about it? So it's one of those things, it's a bit of a management yeah, thing. Bit, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, all, we're happy to be full. We, we'll always, I'm Teflon man, I would always blame somebody else. It would never ever be my fault. And, and that comes a little bit to the, the, the good point that came then. Could we use Depa Provera? The, I think at least if you use Altrenages, which is Regumate, you see, we, we were, that isn't actually progesterone, it's what we call, I don't want to get too technical, but it's an artificial progesterone, and we call that a progestogen. 
and Altrenogest binds around about 75% as effectively to, 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 to the place it should in the mare as proper native progesterone. But Depa-Provera they've looked at hardly binds at all. But I know some people say it, it seems to work, but in, the theory for that is it shouldn't do. Well, not in theory, because Depo-Provera does not, it just simply doesn't, doesn't function as a molecule in the horse. It doesn't attach to the progesterone receptor. If it works, it doesn't yes, well, well that, that's a point, Ian, really. That, that's, a, that's a valid argument as well. I wouldn't use anything other than Altrenogest. So, uh, mare with early pregnancy failure, mare with a at first scan, mare with a poor quality CL at pregnancy scan. And, and yeah, actually, look, I must have even got, I wasn't, I was even lying, look, we're even more, uh, times must have got a bit tight, I think. This, school fees must have gone up. So I decided we'd, in, we'd have them on it even longer now. <laughs> Twice. I tell you, actually, Pippa, I know why this came about. They suddenly marketed uh, the, the, the Regimate for us in a litre pack. And this in a thoroughbred, putting it on at day 15, the litre just lasts for that. So you could send them home at day 40 with that. So that's actually why we changed it there. But, but that's... Uh, it, it's very unscientific to some extent. But I... I, I and so a total ballpark figure would be that I think... Uh, we halved. Our, if people didn't do what we do in mares, that they, that they would have a double the pregnancy failure rate. But remember, the pregnancy failure rate is only 15%. So we're doing all this monkeying around. Yeah. Yeah. So you pay your money, you take your choice. Because the res if we could get a magic bullet from the research guys, we'd do it. But they never gave us one, and they seem to have given up. There, there isn't much work getting done on pregnancy. They, they, we seem to have accepted, well, it's going to be 15%. And I don't think you have to. Now, does anybody know, uh, this is an endoscope picture. An endoscope is just a flexible light source, which we use a lot in, 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 in mares we're, we're struggling with. If we have two cycles in a mare and she won't conceive, she'll get an endoscope exam. We'll have a look inside a uterus. An endoscope, we normally use them for respiratory work. Those of you who do the racehorses, uh, we look at laryngeal and respiratory function. But I mean, you can, you can stick an endoscope up whatever orifice you like. Uh, we, we, we tried to run a course thing in how many things we could endoscope. We actually endoscope stallion. We have to use a, a very small yearling scope, but if a stallion has a, a, a fertility problem or seems to have blood in the ejaculate, we'll always endoscope the stallion as well. Uh, so this is an endoscope picture. I've stuck a, I, 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 I'll tell you about the mare. I'll show you the case uh, in, in a minute. But I, I, I put it in, you wouldn't really know, but you, that is actually uh, a retained endometrial cup. Does anybody, and we'll go through it, uh, does it ring any bell what an endometrial cup is? We'll discount the vets. I hope you guys would know. Uh, yeah, I mean, it has significance in breed. You, you may not know exactly what it is as, as, as breeders or stud managers, but you kind of will know something significant must be happening because what happens if you have a mare uh, that's in foal at, at 30, 32 days, and for some reason, perhaps, you, you know, it happens for us most often if we're doing the fetal sexing at 65 days and the pregnancy has died, but it's died after day 35. Can you cycle that mare again? No, it's very difficult. And you may have wondered why. And the reason is because from around about day 32, 35, the mare produces these unique things we call endometrial cups, which produce a hormone, which effectively means even if that concept as that pregnancy dies, you won't get that mare effectively cycled again, possibly for as long as a further two or three months. So if you add on the fact that it's taken you two months to find that out, you add on another two months. For most thoroughbred breeders, that, that's, that's over, really. So you've got a skipper for that year. 
So that's what endometrial cups are. And uh, you would sort of know, so you knew, you know, most of you will have known the clinical bit behind it in that pregnancy failure after day 34, 36 is this real problem because you just can't get the mare uh, to effectively cycle again. Uh, she may have a regular estrus, but fertility at those, those cycles is very poor. Very, very poor. Certainly in our experience, anyway. And uh, I saw two cases of it four or five, I can't remember, when, th uh, five years ago now. And it doesn't matter how good you think you are, I was getting in a mess with these mares. And in the end, we wrote these two up as a, as a case because they persisted in mares that had undergone uh, failure of the pregnancy. And you won't see this very often, but it is worth your mind, especially if you're dealing with a reasonable number of mares, every year or every other year, you might come across a mare in this category, and I'll, I'll tell you what you have to do to, to deal with them. This was a mare, because uh, it was me who, 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 if you want, kind of missed these mares when they came to stud for me to deal with. Uh, I didn't know the, 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 the first uh, three, three bullet points. Uh, thoroughbred mare was confirmed pregnant, so typically, you know, whatever, whenever you're going to do your scans. Uh, ten months later, the owner of the mare, this, I wasn't looking after the mare, it, you know, I don't know where it was, but anyways. Ten months later, the owner thought the mare isn't in fault. And sure enough, lo and behold, they did a, a manual exam and probably an ultrasound. Mare's not in fault, so it's lost that pregnancy. So, hey, oh, we'll send the mare off to stud. Now, you know, I don't know if you're any better at it here, but, but in the UK, it, they're off, people are shockers at giving you history about a mare. The, the mare will just get dropped off, and I know nothing about it. I, I don't know if you get told a bit. You have a, you know, it was fascinating in Australia where we had a bigger percentage of resident mares that stay on the stud farm for that standard. We don't get that very much in the UK. Most, most public stud farms, they might have two or three of their own mares, but they certainly don't have 30 on one place. So, you know, all these mares are coming from here, there, and everywhere. They may just get dropped off. The owner may not think it's important. It doesn't matter. The bottom line is I very often don't get any history about a mare. So I didn't get any of those first three people. This, this mare just pitched up at, 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 at stud for me three weeks after uh, her own vet had, had tested the mare not in fault. And when she arrived, the left ovary was like the top and the right ovary like the bottom. So I thought, oh, well, fair enough. This mare's got anovulatory hemorrhagic follicles. And we'll talk about those. Our stud managers call them blood follicles. I don't know what you call them, but uh, they don't ovulate properly. Uh, so first time I look at the mare, I, I, hey-ho, fair enough. What do you think I did with that mare? Well, I gave her a dose of prostaglandin. That would seem reasonable enough. And there were no follicles anywhere else on the ovary. So I, I, it goes in our book, prostaglandin C7. So I looked at the mare the next week. And uh, it's ju just the same. So that, oh, I, I, you know, I don't really like it, but maybe I better give prostaglandin on successive days. So maybe day, day one and day two, I gave a dose of prostaglandin. Looked at it a week after that, the same thing. And, and uh, as the stud veterinarians in our practice, we rarely overlap, but I happened to get back to our sort of base and, and one of the, the, the main, the, the most experienced colleague I had was in there as well. So I said, I said, Jim, I said, I'm struggling with this mare here. I said, I've prostaglandin this thing three times now, and I can do nothing with this mare's ovaries. And we had a bit of a think, and uh, we came up with this idea that it could be uh, retained endometrial cups. And we didn't think, we probably should have thought to endoscope her, really. You don't often see them on ultrasound. Very, I've got an image of a retained endometrial cup. But we thought, we had to guess. We thought, well, maybe this man has retained endometrial cups. And uh, James, my colleague, has spent a lot of time out in New Zealand, and they, they, they're quite enthusiastic about use of kerosene in a mare's uterus for... Uh, for a, for a whole range of conditions, really. I, I'm much less keen, but, but he would use it. You know, mares with endometrosis, we're going to talk about that, a lot of scar tissue. Uh, but it certainly will, it, it sort of will strip the uterus. But it isn't particularly, it certainly isn't painful, it isn't damaging. Uh, the one thing I think you have to be fussy with, or, or we are, on the, on the odd occasion I use uh, kerosene, I only use 150 mils. And 
I think it's very prone to causing a vaginal problem in the mare. If that leaks back into the vagina of that mare, it will set up an adhesion, in my experience. So when I've infused the uh, kerosene, I'm very fussy to hold that cervix closed. I only really give it five minutes or so sitting in there, then I withdraw as much as I can out via the insemination catheter, and then I lavage the mare uh, with, with two or three litres of, of, uh, of Ultranagest. And that, that, that's the way we got rid of those retained endometrial cups. So you won't, some of the things we'll talk about, uh, fluid and hemorrhagic follicles, you'll see almost on a daily basis. You won't see this very often. If you have only five or 10 mares, you may never see it. But just have a think. If a mare's at stud and you, you seem to be able to do nothing but get these large hemorrhagic looking uh, 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 follicles or whatever you call them, we call them hemorrhagic follicles. Uh, just have a think or try and delve back in that mare's history. Did, was she, uh, did she have a, uh, a lost pregnancy the year before? Just have a think about endometrial cups. I, 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 got, I think they would have persisted forever. Well, certainly probably for another year maybe. Well, I mean, it's a rarely, I mean, that's why we published that. That was the first report of them in, in mares, really. So we don't, I don't think we truthfully know the answer to that. I guess we felt that if they persisted 12 months, well, then they may, for whatever reason, the mechanism to destroy them had gone wrong. So if they persisted 12 months, I think we felt they would just persist and persist. And the treatment got rid of them. Yeah, kerosene will strip the uterus. It's just I don't think it allows healthy tissue to come back, but, it did. but this mare didn't have an unhealthy uterus. She just had it with persistent endometrial cups. What yeah. The, uh, we, the cause of it, we don't know why the mechanism goes wrong. Normally, I mean, it's variable when they'll go. That's why when we say they have formed, we can't say whether the mare will recycle after one month, two months, or three months. The range they quote is from around about 40 to, to 100 days. But we don't know why they... Uh, the hemorrhagic follicle, well, we'll come on to that, because you must see those. So if we're not recognizing them, you, well, you must call them something else. Or, no, we do call them. Oh, you do get them, right. Yeah, and that's, that, that's the clue, the mare. A mare with, with, with... But it doesn't mean... I don't want you guys to think because a mare has a hemorrhagic follicle, she has a retained endometrial cup. This was a very special circumstance where despite repeated prostaglandin injections, I couldn't get that mare to produce a normal follicle. Same mare that produces them. Yes, I mean, I think they are... Uh, yeah, I mean, you, we, you do wonder if there's a degree of retained endometrial cups in these mares that have a, a, an annoying tendency mm -hmm. to time after time produce these things. But we don't really know. No one studied it enough, really, to know for sure. But it's a good point. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's. Yes, I think you can certainly get in a, well, we've got a little bit on prostaglandin. I think you can certainly get in a little bit of a, a, a mess with prostaglandin if you, if you overdo it. We probably would go in normal situations, I'd do it twice, really, but, but there'd be nothing wrong with doing it just once. I would wonder if I just did it once, whether I'd been too early with that first one. Uh, so I would probably do it twice, but I agree, over, over the last few years I've become reluctant to do it third and fourth times, we'll either say, right, we'll settle it down with some Regumate, or we'll just say, right, we'll leave this mare for two or three weeks. Some of the, one of the stud managers just says, no, it's enough now. We'll just leave this mare to cycle round. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think, I think, I think that, that I think you get a, a, a good boost from the 10, you know, which is effectively you're giving an artificial CL by giving it the progesterone. And I think that certainly gives you a more predictive response. 
I just wouldn't do it routinely because it's sort of a bit, a bit of work. But the minute, so you could have a discussion whether you did it once or twice just before going on to that. But I certainly think, I, I agree that if, it, if it's seeming not to work, the, progest, the prostaglandin, that's a better system. Of course, in that very rare occasion here, it wouldn't have, that, it wouldn't have worked on that occasion. Yeah. Um, you said after using a better thing, you revised them with two or three different Yeah. Of what? Uh, we use lactated ringers. Uh, Hartman's, is it? Saline would be just as good. There's a bit of a feeling that saline's mildly irritant to the uterus, which, considering you've just put kerosene in, I don't. I don't yeah, I think saline's just as good. We would often use. Uh, and we gave them oxytocin after that as well. I just was wary of, of, that, of that kerosene leaking. I, I, I saw Meg get horrendous vaginal adhesions after it, and, and I think it's because it leaked. For some reason, I think there's a difference between the, the, the endometrium, the uterine lining, and the vaginal lining, and I just saw a horrendous, it seemed to almost slough off. It was awful. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, no, I think it was, uh, and, and uh, we see it occasionally we get a dress, mares come across from the continent where they still do it, and it's when you put in uh, post-folding post flushes of, of any form of antiseptic, I, I, betadine I think is horrendous in a mare's uterus. I think you, if you're going to put, if you in, for some reason feel you have to put betadine in, I think it wants to be at something, not point not one percent, it doesn't even want to be 0.1, it wants to be like 0.01, it wants to look like the weakest of tea or something. But I would just flush with, with ordinary tap water. If we're going to do a post, not, not a post breeding infusion, but a post foaling lavage, we don't, we don't bother with sterile saline. We would use water from the tap, well, don't want to be rude about your taps, but I presume they're okay. Don't want to get into a political thing. <laughs> but, but anyways. Uh, so, okay, that, that really was, was sort of all, uh, all I wanted to say about uh, pregnancy failure. Now, 